E, bu önemli günde e, değerli konuklarımızı öncelikle Sayın Bakan Yardımcımız Sayın Alpaslan Bayraktar e, ve diğer bakanlarımıza hoş geldin demek istiyorum. E, distinguished guests, dear ministers, ambassador, friends and colleagues, welcome to Renewable Energy Outlet Conference today, e, hosted, co-hosted by us, Atlantic Council and the EBRD. Thank you so much for joining us to this important gathering. We actually have almost 300 participation from 79 different companies. Half of each from of these companies are from uh, international uh, companies and the region. It is with great pride that I kick off this event, exploring the future of renewable energy across this core region of the world. Again, it's an honor to be joined today by Deputy Energy Minister of Turkey, Mr. Alpaslan Bayraktar. We are also honored by participation of His Excellency Nasser Nureddini, the North Macedonian Minister of Environmental and Physical Planning, and we are greatly looking forward to hosting Her Excellency Belinda Baluku, Albanian Minister of Infrastructure and Energy this afternoon. Unfortunately, His Excellency Fatih Dönmez, Turkey's Minister of Energy and Natural Resources, could not join us here today. He is on his way to Pakistan, uh, now with President Erdogan, with a last minute change in his schedule. Mr. Minister told me late last night in person that he is very sorry that he could not be here today with his peer ministers and all of us. It is also my great pleasure to welcome here in Istanbul, Fred Kemp, the President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Fred, I'm so glad that you could be with us here today and demonstrate once again Council's commitment to Turkey and the region. I would like to give special thanks to the Atlantic Council in Turkey's program partners. Without their support, our work would not be possible. Finally, I would like to thank our conference co-host, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, for helping to reach out our ambitious expectations for this conference. This was truly a big team effort. As we enter a new decade, the global energy system is witnessing a rapid change. The past decade has seen 2.5 trillion US dollars of renewable energy investment, leading to a major jump in global renewable capacity. Solar capacity alone has grown more than 25 times over the past 10 years. Today, global annual investment in renewables is more than double the annual investment in fossil fuel generation. <coughs> These trends are poised only to accelerate in coming years as leading financiers from BlackRock to Goldman Sachs and beyond reshape their strategies ar around the unifying team of investing for a more sustainable globe. These tectonic shifts toward clean energy and sustainable investments in the global economy and financial system are of course driven not only by technological innovation and rapidly falling costs, but also by a recognition of the destruction that awaits if we fail to deliver on the transition to a low carbon society. The leaders in this room today have an outsized role to play in addressing some of these challenges. From the massive scale up in wind and solar in Turkey and the region, to the construction of a new transmission infrastructure that will better integrate neighbors and will help to unlock the region's renewable potential that are indeed an exciting path to take ahead of us. According to the IEA, Turkey's renewable energy capacity currently at 42 gigawatt is expected to increase by a remarkable 50% in the next four years, which would make Turkey's renewables arsenal the 11th largest in the world. Now, without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce Nandita Parshat, the Managing Director of EBRD's Sustainable Infrastructure Group, which manages a portfolio of around 20 billion euros, covering the energy, transport, and municipal infrastructure sectors. Nandita has 30 years' experience in financing and investing in energy and infrastructure sector in emerging economies, such as India, Eastern Europe, Mon uh, Mongolia, and of course, including Turkey. And Nandita, and also thank you for being such a good friend of Atlantic Council for a long time. Floor is yours. Thank you.
Thank you, Daphne, for that kind introduction. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Joint EBRD and Atlantic Council Renewable Energy Outlook Conference to discuss a subject very close to my heart, and I hope all of yours too, as well as one central to the EBRD's mandate, renewable energy, the energy that will never run out, that is clean, green, and secure. I hope that our conversations and interactions today will be fruitful and spark increased momentum for renewables in Turkey, Central Asia, the Caucasus, and the West Balkans. This discussion is no longer a choice, but a necessity. Meeting the challenge of the climate emergency is the most urgent task we face today. The impacts are devastating, from fires raging in Australia to flooding in the Gulf countries, from Stockholm still waiting for the arrival of winter to the melting glaciers in Antarctica. The consequences of these events are frightening, yet greenhouse gases emissions continue to rise. We need decisive action to address this. We cannot rest. The role of renewable energy is critical. The world needs decarbonized electricity to continue to grow, and renewables will have to deliver that. Recent figures on what we need to do to meet the emissions targets in line with even the two degree scenario make for sobering reading and we will hear much more today from many of you on how big this challenge is. It's clear, we can no longer think of megawatts, but gigawatts of clean energy in our ambition and our delivery. There is good news, however. Prices for renewables keep falling, and in many places, projects are now built without any subsidies. Only a few years ago, we used to ask ourselves, can we afford renewable energy? Now the question is, can the world afford not to have large-scale renewable energy, as it is fast becoming the most affordable source of energy? A huge effort from developers, regulators, manufacturers, contractors, and financiers has created a revolution that we are all now familiar with. In country after country, the cheapest power available comes from the wind and the sun. The results are remarkable. The most recent auction for renewables with storage in India returned a price of under 9 US cents a kilowatt hour for 1.2 gigawatts of capacity. The price for solar energy in the Gulf is now under 1.6 cents per kilowatt hour. And in our region, represented here today, we have Uzbekistan, who achieved 2.7 cents per kilowatt hour for a solar PV auction recently. These record low prices show how the economics of clean energy can help address climate change, and although time is running out, it's not too late to change our fate. Our host country, Turkey, is a splendid example of what a government can achieve when it sets itself ambitious targets and takes the right policy actions. By the end of 2017, Turkey had already exceeded its 2023 target of 30% of its electricity from renewable energy. So I look forward today to the exciting panels we have, where we have all the stakeholders who can truly make this energy transition and the gigawatts of renewables we need happen. Influential think tanks, such as our coordinator of this event, the Atlantic Council, with its global energy vision and reach. Key policy makers, such as our host, Deputy Minister Alpaslan Bayraktar, and many other ministers from Albania, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Serbia, Kazakhstan, North Macedonia, and Uzbekistan. You have the power to both set the ambition and take the detailed actions needed to ensure the enabling policy framework. We're also very glad to have amongst the stakeholders here many, many leading investors and developers from all around the world. You have the cap capacity and the capability to build and operate the gigawatts of projects needed. And finally, yet importantly, the financiers are here who are needed to fund these projects. We at EBRD see ourselves as a lead financier and investor in renewables in this region. And we stand ready to provide both finance and policy support to both governments and the private sector for creating the enabling regulatory framework, arranging the needed procurement processes, and investing in the projects needed to realize these ambitions. Last year, EBRD financed about two gigawatts of new renewables. 
We're also working with 14 countries to design and launch renewable energy auctions. From our geothermal investments in Turkey to hydropower in Georgia, from the first wind farm in Kosovo to 600 megawatts of private solar PV financed in Kazakhstan. We see energy transformation happening across the region with EBRD playing a leading role. We need so much more of this, working together in partnership with think tanks, with governments, with investors to push the energy transition. So I hope today's event will invigorate the drive and inspire us all further to pursue a modern and renewable energy future. A future that will make good use of the abundant renewable energy potential of your countries to tackle the climate emergency, air pollution and resource scarcity by harnessing ideas and technological innovation. Let us leave here today with a renewed sense of purpose and a desire to continue this great green renewable revolution. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Atlantic Council President and CEO Fred Kemp. Since 2007, Fred has led the Council, expanding its size and influence with historic industry-leading growth. And I might add, amazing partnerships, including the one with EBRD. Before joining the Council, Fred was prize-winning editor and reporter at the Wall Street Journal for more than 25 years. Fred is a dedicated Atlanticist and a good friend to EBRD. Welcome, Fred. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what an immense pleasure it is for me to be back in beautiful Istanbul, where continents meet. Now, some people will just say that sentence, what a pleasure it is to be back. But a couple of hours after I landed, one of our partners uh, offered to take me down the Bosporus on his boat um, <clears throat> in the open back last evening at night when it wasn't particularly warm. Um, but you can't help but conjure up visions of history, centuries of history, as you look left to Asia, as you look right to Europe, and then make the turn back and, and under the bridges and, and just see history and, and, and also feel the future. So I love being in this city. And even if it were not for the geopolitical importance, the economic importance, the regional uh, importance, Turkey is important in so many different ways. Uh, I would come back here just for the aesthetical importance of this city. Um, I'm very grateful to have as a representative in Turkey, Defne Arslan, who has done a spectacular job managing the Council's Turkey program with her wonderful team, including Pinar Dost and Grady Wilson. Um, leadership also sh is shown by uh, the team one brings together. And, and, and, I, and indeed, I really thank you for the partnership with the EBRD. Uh, we've worked together in various places on various things, and, and, and we're also happy to, always happy to do this. In this very long, centuries-old history uh, of uh, uh, Istanbul and Constantinople before that, the Council just has a 10-year history in Turkey, uh, beginning with large events uh, as this. And since then, we've been deepening our programming so that we're operating throughout the year. And DEFNA has a unique uh, setup here with the Atlantic Council in Turkey. Uh, where she just doesn't, she doesn't just do work on Turkey and on the region, but she's, she has access to the work of all of our 13 programs and centers, uh, ranging from work on Africa uh, to, of course, work on energy. Uh, so I'd like to thank her for her uh, leadership in cementing our role as a leading partner, convener, and innovator for this crucial bilateral relationship. Um, uh, we're happy to contribute to this not just through the work we do here, but also the work we do in the United States, which will be increasing, and also, uh, and also elsewhere around the world. We're pleased to be convening today's Regional Re Renewable Energy Outlook Conference, um, and as I said, I'm deeply grateful to the EBRD. It's also a privilege to hold this event uh, with the participation of so many high-level government officials and executives from throughout the region. 
And I would in particular like to thank Turkish Deputy Energy Minister Bayraktar for being with us uh, today. It's an honor to have you, sir. Uh, I'd also like to thank participating ministers from North Macedonia and Albania, as well as deputy ministers and senior representatives uh, from the regions around us. We're honored to have you. This conference builds on our inaugural re renewables gathering here in Istanbul in late 2018. And we hope to build this into an annual mainstay, bringing together energy leaders from across the region, not just to discuss these important issues, but to set a course for accelerating the energy transition and ensuring that renewables deliver real environmental, economic, and energy security benefits for this pivotal part of the world. I've never liked the term think tank because thinking is only the first step to the action that we all have to undertake together. Uh, it's a good starting point, but not insufficient, uh, but insufficient. This is a city that serves as a symbol for the trends and trajectories we will be discussing today. A city with one foot in Europe, which many ways unleashed the renewables revolution, but another foot in Asia, which represents the future of renewables growth. As I previously said, this is a city where the Atlantic Council is no stranger. We're proud to have our largest office outside the United States here and for, to have convened here for many years. The world's eyes are focused on this region of the world, of course, for the geopolitical dynamics unfolding at the heart of Eurasia, but also for the profound ways in which the energy transition is poised to reshape economies, societies, and interconnections throughout the region. 2019 offered all of us uh, some wake-up calls on how climate change could not simply set back or slow the global economy or society, but risk the very prosperity and security uh, that has underwritten the post-Cold War global order. Uh, consider the wildfires in Australia, Brazil, and California that have taken lives, destroyed ecosystems, and bankrupted companies. Consider the extreme heat suffocating many urban areas. 2019, in fact, was the second hottest year ever recorded at a time when urbanization and electrification of everything has cemented an economy and society dependent on rapid economic growth. Consider the polarization of our politics and the dual challenge of addressing climate change while delivering on other social imperatives. Indeed, climate-fueled natural disasters have cost the economy almost $1 trillion over the past five years. The energy transition is driven in part by the quest to avoid these costs and will require massive investment, but if implemented correctly, will bring about, will bring about countries' co-benefits and will become a driver of economic growth, innovation, and energy security for all. So it makes great environmental sense to go in this direction. It makes huge business sense to go in this direction. At the Atlantic Council, we have embraced some of the most intractable global issues as the defining challenges of our times. These are the crucial transformational issues that will define the direction of our world will take. We take them as a call to action. I'm pleased to announce that of this year, sustaining the environment and addressing climate change is one of the Atlantic Council's six defining challenges. Uh, we also take a look at uh, uh, the rise of um, uh, uh, major power conflict, uh, the contest uh, uh, for democracies and their strength in the world, questions about the U.S. role in the world going forward, questions about the very nature of the global system we have, questions about emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, bioengineering, uh, how that will shape the world, and then finally, and maybe even most importantly, the future of the planet uh, itself, and our role as friends and allies in addressing this. Um, we take this quite seriously, not just as a think tank, but as a do tank. Our work on climate and environmental includes the climate change mitigation efforts of our Global Energy Center, some of which will be uh, featured during this forum, and I'm delighted that David Livingston is here representing that center, uh, one of the uh, great, great, great thinkers in this whole area of work. Um, and that includes mobilizing capital and de-risking clean energy investment. 
improving policy frameworks for renewables and nuclear energy, and driving the decarbonization of fossil fuels. We also are not just doing mitigation efforts, we're also uh, involved in climate adaptation efforts at the Atlantic Council's Adrian R. Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center, uh, which uh, received a very generous $30 million grant last year from the, um, uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation. And our aim there is to reach a billion people with resilient solutions to climate change, migration, and security challenges by 2030. Our global resilience work will range from reducing the effects of extreme heat on vulnerable people, and heat is one of the world's great killers, uh, to developing innovative finance and risk products, and developing new policy approaches to reduce biodiversity loss, ocean risks, and human migration. Uh, it's a huge task. We certainly don't think the Atlantic Council or any other organization can do it alone, uh, but we wouldn't be uh, performing our work if we didn't want to play our part. Embedded across these efforts is a focus to bring together individuals, communities, and a broad spectrum of governments and institutions to help them and their constituencies and stakeholders better prepare for, navigate, and recover from shocks and stresses. Together, these two efforts, mitigation from climate adaptation to climate change, can help create a better future for us and future generations. We will work, focused as ever on real impact, to not only buffer the world from climate-related shocks to come, but also to bend the trajectory of the energy sector, because it cannot and it will not be business as usual as we go forward. We don't shy away from the tough challenges that many are afraid to tackle, such as how to diversify companies and economies away from carbon-intensive paths, or building bridges between partners that will shape our collective energy and climate future. And that's why we're here today, not to talk about these changes in isolation or within the bounds of a single country or economy, but instead to explore what the growth of clean energy bodes for the region and what can be done to harvest the opportunities it presents from cross-border infrastructure to enhanced energy security to innovative economies to unlocking human potential across the region and far beyond across the world. Uh, I look forward to hearing what the day holds and to building on the ideas formulated here over the rest of the year. It's now my honor to introduce uh, Mr. Alparslan Bayraktar, the Deputy Minister of Energy and Natural Resources of the Republic of Turkey. Before taking on his current role, uh, the Deputy Minister previously served as Deputy Undersecretary of the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources of Turkey, as well as serving as the Ministry's General Director of Foreign Affairs and the EU. From 2010 to 2016, he served as a Commissioner of Energy Market Regulatory Authority of Turkey. Before joining the public sector, he had an accomplished private sector career working in energy and information technology. Uh, in very short, he knows what he's talking about, and he has the experience to speak with authority. Alongside his current duties, Deputy Minister, the Deputy Minister serves as Chairman of the World Energy Council Turkey, as well as the uh, Istanbul Center for Regulation. He's been instrumental in leading Turkey's most recent wave of energy sector reforms and in designing the policy frameworks that have successfully attracted large-scale investment in Turkey's renewable sector. He's an important and valued partner for the Atlantic Council, and we're pleased to welcome him here today. Also, as, any, as one would assume with everything he's done in his life, uh, an education background that is really impressive, starting with his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Istanbul Technical University, his LLM in law and economics from Bill Kent, uh, and then we hope that the United States did not spoil this extra, uh, enormously good education with the Fletcher School at Tufts University and your master's in international relations. Mr. Deputy, my minister, uh, your, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here.
Saygıdeğer bakanlar, kıymetli katılımcılar, hanımefendiler, beyefendiler, öncelikle Atlantik Konsey ve İBRD'nin birlikte düzenlemiş olduğu bu program vesilesiyle sizlerle bir arada olmaktan duyduğum memnuniyeti ifade ederek sözlerime başlamak istiyorum. Enerji ve ekonomi alanlarında önemli araştırmalara, kapsamlı raporlara imza atan, Birçok farklı uzmanı bir araya getirerek enerjinin geleceğine yön veren organizasyonlar tertip eden Atlantik Konsey ve özellikle ülkemizin son 15-20 yılındaki büyük dönüşümünde çok önemli bir finansal paydaş olan EBRD'nin kıymetli yönetici ve çalışanlarını katkı ve emeklerinden dolayı tebrik ediyorum. Bu ve benzeri programlar sürdürülebilir bir enerji geleceği ve ortak bir gelecek ufkunun ortaya konması bakımından oldukça kıymetli tartışmalara, yeni fikirlere, farklı bakış açılarına ev sahipliği yapıyor. Bu yönüyle bu zirvenin, bu konferansın sonuçlarının hem katılımcılar hem de ülkemiz için faydalı olmasını diliyorum. Kıymetli misafirler, günümüzde dünya siyasetinin belirleyen güvenlik kaygıları başta enerji olmak üzere her alana yayılmış durumda. Her geçen gün artan politik riskler, jeopolitik riskler ve teknolojide yaşanan Baş döndürücü hızdaki dönüşüm ülkelerin uzun dönemli enerji politikalarında ciddi değişimler yaşanmasına sebep oluyor. Bu çerçevede enerjide kaynak çeşitliliğini yaratmak, yerli ve yenilenebilir enerji kaynak kullanımına geçmek, özellikle Türkiye gibi enerjide dışa bağımlılığı yüksek ülkelerin sürdürülebilir bir büyüme gerçekleştirmesi için hayati bir önem taşıyor. Bugün dünyada yaşanan enerji dönüşümüne baktığımızda enerjide oyuncuların, ülkelerin ve rollerin değiştiğini görüyoruz. Yenilenebilir enerji, akıllı sistemler, talep tarafı yönetimi, yapay zeka ve depolama gibi teknolojiler enerjide dönüşümü zorluyor ve adeta zorunlu kılıyor. Tüketici aynı zamanda üretici oluyor. Bunun ötesinde aynı zamanda tüketici kavramı için artık insan yerine nesneleri ve nesnelerin interneti tabanlı yeni bir enerji talebinin doğduğunu görüyoruz. Yani oyuncular artık cansız nesneler ve yapay zeka yazılımları da olabiliyor. Enerjideki bu dönüşüm sürecinde yoğun bir şekilde yaşandığı bu süreçte biz Enerji ve Tabi Kaynaklar Bakanlığı olarak milli enerji ve maden politikamız ile yerli kaynaklarımızın enerji portföyüne daha fazla dahil olduğu, buna mukabil dışa bağımlı olduğumuz kaynakları da piyasa bazlı daha kolay yönetilebilir bir noktaya getirmeyi hedeflediğimiz çok boyutlu bir politikayı hayata geçirmeye çalışıyoruz. Bu anlamda yenilenebilir enerjide özellikle Türkiye'nin aldığı mesafeyi ve hedeflerimizi sizlerle paylaşmak istiyorum. Bugün itibariyle Türkiye'de yenilenebilir kurulu güç 45 bin megawata ulaştı. Kurulu gücümüzün yüzde 49'unu yani neredeyse yani bugün toplam kurulu gücümüzün yüzde 49'unu yenilenebilir enerji kaynakları oluşturmakta. Son 10 yılda toplam kurulu gücümüzün yüzde 60'ını yenilenebilir enerji kaynaklarından elde ettik. Yine son 10 yılda toplam kurulu gücümüz yıllık yüzde 7 artarken yenilenebilir enerji yatırımları yüzde 11 oranında arttı. Bugün yenilenebilir enerji kurulu gücünde Avrupa'da 6. Dünyada 13. sıradayız. Geçtiğimiz yıl yenilenebilir kaynaklardan elektrik üretimimiz 5 Haziran'da tarihi bir rekora imza attı ve saatlik bazda Türkiye enerjisinin yüzde 76'sını yenilenebilir kaynaklardan sağlamış oldu. 2019 rüzgar ve güneş enerjisinden elektrik üretiminde önemli bir yıl olarak kayıtlara geçti. Rüzgar enerjisinden elektrik üretimimiz yüzde on yedilik bir payla yine rekor kırdı. 2019'da güneşte ise elde edilen üretim yüzde onlar mertebesine yükseldi. Bugün Türkiye rüzgar ve güneş üretiminde hiçbir zorunlu kesinti uygulamayan ve ne kadar üretiliyorsa en öncelikli kaynak olarak sistemine dahil eden bir ülke ve bu yönde yatırımlarımız devam ediyor. Daha fazla yenilenebiliri sistemimizi almak için altyapı yatırımlarımız devam ediyor. Kıymetli katılımcılar, 2023 yılında elektrik tüketimimizin 376 milyar kilowatt saat seviyelerinde olacağını öngörüyoruz. Bu nedenle elektrik enerjisinin farklı kaynaklarla desteklenmesi için yerli ve yenilenebilir kaynaklara daha fazla ağırlık vermeye devam edeceğiz. 
Çünkü yerli ve yenilenebilir kaynaklara yapılan her bir puanlık artış, yerli ve yenilenebilir kaynaklardaki her bir puanlık yükselme ekonomimize katkısı yaklaşık 100 milyon dolar civarında. Dolayısıyla ithal kaynak bağımlılığımızın yarattığı cari açığın azaltılmasında yerli ve yenilenebilir kaynaklar fevkalade önem arz etmekte. Bu yıl hayata geçireceğimiz mini yakalarla güneş enerjisinde 1000 megawattlık bir kaynak tahsisi daha gerçekleştireceğiz. Mini yakalar dediğimiz yenilenebilir enerji yatırımlarının tabana yayılması için önemli bir motivasyon olacak. Mini yakaların ilkini bu yılın ilk yarısında gerçekleştirmeyi planlıyoruz. Ve önümüzdeki 10 yıl içerisinde de 10 megawatt, 10 gigawatt, 10 bin megawatt güneş ve 10 bin megawatt rüzgar enerjisi başta olmak üzere yenilenebilir kaynakların maksimum düzeyde enerji miksimiz içerisinde yer almasını hedefliyoruz. Kıymetli konuklar, enerjide öne çıkan en önemli konulardan bir tanesi de RG ve teknoloji yatırımları. Teknolojinin gelişmesiyle birlikte özellikle yenilenebilir enerji alanındaki maliyetlerin düşüşü bu yatırımların artışını önemli ölçüde tetikledi. Yaka modelimizde bu alandaki değişimi ayak uydurmak için attığımız adımlara kararlılıkla devam edeceğiz. Türkiye'yi yenilenebilir enerjide üretim ve teknoloji üssü yapmak için yerli üretim, tedarik, ARGE ve inovasyon odaklı yaklaşımımızı sürdüreceğiz. Türkiye'nin enerji dönüşümünde önümüzdeki dönemin belirleyicileri ARGE, inovasyon ve startuplar olacak diye düşünüyoruz. Enerji sadece bir kaynak problemi olmadığı gibi enerji dönüşümü de sadece bir yakıt ikamesi değildir. Enerji dönüşümü inanıyoruz ki tüm enerji sisteminin dönüşümüdür. Ve bu dönüşümün en kilit oyuncusu kaynak değil teknoloji olacak diye düşünüyoruz. Bu anlamda özellikle genç girişimcileri ve startupları destekliyoruz. Biliyorsunuz Boren ve hidrojen laboratuvarlarımızı ilgilenenlere açtık. ARGE ve startup toplantıları yaptık. Şimdi yeni bir altyapı programı üzerinde çalışıyoruz. Ve bu enerji dönüşümü serüveninde rol almak isteyen herkesi de bu inovasyon programına davet ediyoruz. Yerli enerji kaynaklarının ekonomiye kazandırılması, yenilenebilir enerji ve nükleer başta olmak üzere ulusal enerji kaynaklarının çeşitlendirilmesi, enerji verimliliğinin teşvik edilmesi, kaynak ülke ve güzergah çeşitliliğinin artırılması, küresel enerji işbirliklerinin geliştirilmesi ve yabancı yatırımın teşvik edilmesi gibi konularda önümüzdeki dönemle e, üymelenerek artacak. Bu süreci daha da geliştirme hedefliyoruz. Bu duygu ve düşüncelerle panelde de devam edeceğim için konuşmamı burada sonlandırmak istiyorum. Bu toplantıyı düzenleyen başta Atlantik Konseyi olmak üzere EBRD'ye teşekkür ediyorum. Bu konferansın tüm katılımcılar ve Türkiye için güzel sonuçlarla neticelenmesini diliyor. Bu vesileyle hepinize tekrar saygılar sunuyorum. Teşekkür ederiz. Sayın Bakan Yardımcımız teşekkür ederiz. Aile fotoğrafı için sizi biraz bekletmek istiyoruz. We invite the speakers of the opening session as well the speakers of the upcoming panel Regional Renewable Energy Outlook to the podium for the family picture.
All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, first of all, um, I want to welcome all the panelists on the first panel and everyone in the audience uh, to our opening session focusing on the regional renewable energy outlook. In Nandita's open remarks, she mentioned that the world, that we, we don't have a question of can we afford renewable energy anymore. With the dramatic decline in costs, the question is now indeed can the world afford not to have renewable energy on a large scale? So these changes have fundamentally questioned, these changes caused by the decline in costs, have fundamentally questioned everything about pricing, about risk allocation, about market structures and regulation. While offering a promise of sustainable, affordable and decarbonized electricity sector. So today we will focus on what we can learn from recent successes We'll share ideas on how to create the green, the great green renewable transition that we all would like to see globally in, and, and in our region, in the region. So in the region here, we speak about Central Asia, Caucasus, West Balkans, and of course, Turkey. Setting targets represents only the first starting point for uh, most renewable energy policymakers. However, an objective alone is not enough to start to create a vibrant local energy, renewable energy sector. Targets must be accompanied by specific policies so that all stakeholders have proper incentives to create sufficient incentives to act. So what is the potential for renewable energy development in Turkey, Central Asia, West Balkans, Caucasus? How to advance institutional, legislative and regulatory frameworks to harness this potential? I'm delighted to be sharing the stage with such an impressive panel, and I'm sure it will make uh, for a very interesting discussion and hopefully will set the right tone for the rest of the conference today. Let me introduce um, our panelists, and then we are going to dive in straight into the discussion, and at the end of the panel, I'll open the floor to the audience. Starting from my left, um, His Excellency, Mr. Nasser Nouridini, Minister of Environmental and Physical Planning of the Republic of North Macedonia. <laughs> Mr. Alp Arslan Bayraktar, Deputy Minister of Energy and Natural Resources of the Republic of Turkey. <laughs> Mr. Sherjot Hojaev, Deputy Minister of Energy of the Republic of Uzbekistan. Ms. Ainur Saspanova, the Head of Renewable Energy Department, Ministry of Energy of the Republic of Kazakhstan. <laughs> Ms. Mirjana Filipovic, the State Secretary at the Ministry of Mining and Energy of the Republic of Serbia. <laughs> Mr. Zaur Mamadov, the Chief of Staff at the Ministry of Energy of the Republic of Azerbaijan. <laughs> and Mr. Georgi Cikavani, the CEO of the state-owned Georgian Energy Development Fund. Welcome. Thank you all uh, for being here today. The session will be on the record. There should be um, tweets and handles, so please tweet, spread the word. And um, let's start. If I could describe the panel today, it's, the key word here would be diverse. We will have a sweeping journey across different geographies, energy markets, across different stages of development in renewables, and I'm sure the audience is just excited as I am. So the first, first things first, um, Your Excellency, uh, Minister Nouridini, um, together with moving to large-scale deployment of renewables, uh, a number of countries face the question what to do with the existing carbon-intensive industries. And uh, one of the main topics in the EU is the Just Transition Initiative for coal region. And this is something that uh, North Macedonia has de facto already started doing. Uh, Oslo May, where uh, EBRD are uh, financing 10 megawatt uh, solar power plant on the site of a decommissioned coal mine. Um, this is a very good example of just transition, but do you, do you plan to replicate it? Do you have um, ambitions for more? And maybe the success of Oslo May can be spread out beyond North Macedonia. What's your thinking? Uh, thank you. Dear Excellencies, Dear ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very current question to be honest with you. And the project we started together with EBRD recently, the 10 megawatt, I appreciate it's not very large in scale for a lot of the other countries, but for us it's a great step forward. 
Uh, what we are actually doing together with the EBRD is starting the Sterling Megawatt project to see whether it's feasible for us and whether we can actually do the just transition, especially in the old decommissioned mine, and where the, currently we have a coal-powered uh, plant as well, fire plant. Um, based on that project, we can positively say that we have seen that there's actually viability to build, to have these solar farms there. As of yesterday, the Prime Minister and the Minister of Economy also just announced two further projects and the same site of 50 megawatt each. This will be international tenders and uh, we hope that there's going to be enough interest from in the international community as well as the local uh, companies. These are not the first projects we're working on. We recently just finished a 35 megawatt tender. We had a very large interest from the international community as well as the local companies. And we are hoping to actually move forward in building on our renewable energies because currently the situation we're in is the majority of the energy we generate is actually from uh, coal-powered fire plants and it's about the 60% or so plus of the energy we generate that comes from that. What we're only not looking at is not only the solar, we also have some wind farms and I think we have one of the l largest wind farms in the region right now. Uh, however, we're also looking at starting and the a hydropower plant uh, in Cheburn, which is of uh, great importance to us. It could, be about, it could generate up to 350 megawatt. This is in the process, we're hopefully to be announcing this in the very near future. And uh, we hope to be able to say that we have a larger percentage of uh, renewable energy in our country in the very near future. Whereas at the same time, as you mentioned, we do have an old industry of, uh, of uh, coal and we need to find jobs as well for those people. So just transition could be an answer. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, from the country which is only starting the transition to renewables to a country which already had an outstanding journey in the past decade. So um, Deputy Minister Bayraktar, um, I'm talking of course about Turkey where the government is determined to further increase share of renewables in the energy mix. What are the key lessons learned throughout this journey? What do you think will be useful for the countries present here? And of course, um, I can't um, avoid the question on the post-2020 setup and the scheme, what the outlook is. Okay, thank you. Uh, look, before jumping to your question, I would like to a uh, little bit emphasize where renewables stand for in Turkish power market, Turkish energy market in general, and also how renewables are changing our uh, paradigm. Uh, because it's a large-scale uh, renewable we, uh, we are utilizing and it's really uh, a game-changer for Turkish energy market. But before that, you need to understand our market's challenges uh, and, and also our policy objectives because Turkish energy market, I mean, there are many market actors here, investors, uh, financiers, uh, they know well and Turkish energy market has gone through a major, a major transition over the last uh, 15 years. Uh, it was a political commitment and, and, and willingness to change the market structures and uh, I call this era uh, transition 1.0. We successfully completed that and it was a, a pure change of market structures for, from vertically integrated market model, state-owned enterprises, uh, privatized uh, and the market model turned into a, a working, functioning, competitive uh, market. So this was a big change, uh, a painful change, uh, but the government uh, took the initiative uh, and showed the uh, real commitment to that. So lessons learned, one thing that uh, if you would like to change, if you, if you would like to introduce uh, more uh, utilize en uh, energy sources, renewables, or other things that the political commitment is key thing. So you need to show this uh, political commitment. And uh, challenges, Turkish energy market is so obvious, the demand is growing in this country, as well as import dependency. So biggest challenge that we are facing as energy officials or any uh, market actors here is to reduce this import dependency. That's why renewables are, uh, at the beginning, like 10, 15 years ago, it was a, a trending topic, it still is, but it was a necessity for Turkish energy market. So 
we were trying to reduce our import dependency. So that's why we went to that pathway to uh, introduce more and more renewables. And the challenge at that time, uh, what kind of scheme that uh, we, we, we were going to uh, give for the investors. And we followed the similar steps that our continental Europe examples or like a US examples or uh, other countries example that feed in tariff. We introduced a feed in tariff scheme. But many people, many investors, either domestic investors or foreign investors at that time criticized very low figures of feed in tariffs. Uh, and today, everybody again is criticizing these uh, figures, but this, is, this time is in an opposite direction because everybody is complaining that the, the prices are so high, renewable support scheme. So, uh, so that's why uh, final consumers, either industrial or households, they are suffering right now the, this uh, premium that they are paying for renewable uh, support scheme. So lessons number two. Uh, at, at that time, Turkey, I believe, did successfully find an optimal way of supporting renewables. Uh, I'm quite sure if we introduce at that time uh, higher figures, instead of $7.3 cents per kilowatt hour for wind, we could have done it like a 10, 12, and I'm quite sure that we are, uh, we are going to be able to attract more investment into, uh, into wind uh, or solar. Uh, but we somehow try to find an optimal way of support for renewables. And lesson number two is when you introduce a new set uh, of rules for newcomers, new technologies, which is today also uh, valid for battery storage. So we are introducing, I mean, more or less all countries are considering to include battery storage or like a carbon capture and utilization is considered to be, uh, to be added into our energy systems or uh, energy efficiency measures. All these new things, newcomers in town, uh, will be carefully designed and uh, with less costly and as well as like a less distortive in terms of uh, market structures. So these are the key uh, things that uh, we need to pay attention. But uh, what we have learned and what we have achieved during the last 10, 15 years with renewables, uh, if you ask me to describe it with two words, it was a game changer for Turkey. Let me explain why. In Turkish energy market, natural gas, in power market, natural gas was playing a very significant role. Just a few years back, uh, Turkey was producing its energy, its power, almost 48, 50% from natural gas. And last year, it was just 18%. I know last year it was a uh, very uh, wet uh, year and, and we had an abundant hydrocarbon uh, uh, hydro, hydrogen uh, power generation, hydropower generation. Maybe it's not going to be the same this year, but significant amount of reduction uh, from com uh, in terms of power coming from gas power generation. So in that sense, renewables, especially renewables, and some other investments like uh, local coal, made it possible that we reduce uh, the, the gas share uh, to reasonable uh, numbers, reasonable figures. So that's why renewables are game changer. And I gave the numbers during my opening remarks that last year in June, we were able to provide 75% of uh, power only from renewables. So we need to extend this hours to days and hopefully weeks and months. So this is quite uh, important. And that's why now the gas market in Turkey is changing. So uh, we benefited a lot from the renewables, but again, uh, two key messages uh, to introducing a new scheme. Uh, it should be less costly, less market distortive, uh, and, but eventually political commitment and willingness paved the way for, for newcomers. And maybe in the second round, I can talk about a little bit post-2020 uh, and, and afterwards. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Just to, to sum up, the three key lessons is the renewables are a game changer. You need political buy-in. And be careful about the costing at the time yes. you introduce the feed-in tariffs and just look at the yes. new technologies coming. Well, going further east, 
We are all enthusiastic about rapid changes in the power sector in Uzbekistan. Uh, Deputy Minister, uh, Mr. Khajaev, um, what, what, how does the Minister of Energy see perspective of private sponsors becoming into the sector and driving the renewables growth? Um, will it be the ultimate driver? Because we know Uzbekistan has just undergone this massive uh, unbundling and restructuring. The Uzbekistan sector, power sector, uh, has undergone the uh, rest, un unbundling and restructuring. So what is the role for renewables there? Do you expect the private interest to drive it forward? Thank you. Your Excellencies, dear guests, uh, in our policy, uh, we understand that renewables uh, for Uzbekistan this is something new. Uh, so far, we don't have any solar or wind power plants. So government decided to attract private investment to solar and wind power plants sector. So it will be fully private, non-state uh, investment. And we believe that uh, within 10 years time, by 2030, uh, we can reach the 5,000 megawatt installed capacity for solar and 3,000 for wind, uh, which will be around 25% uh, of overall installed capacity. Uh, for this, uh, we are working with different IFIs. Uh, for example, with IFC, we announced uh, the program for solar power plants, which we, it's co which called uh, Scaling Solar in Uzbekistan. And uh, recently, last year, we finalized first bidding and we received uh, the very good tariff. 2.67 cents and uh, with ADB also we started uh, the program for solar uh, with total capacity 1000 megawatt and recently we announced the tender for 200 megawatt and our expectation is uh, lower than 2.5 cents. Uh, also within this year we will um, announce three more tenders uh, 200 megawatt each. Plus, of course, we are working with EBRD. This is also very uh, interesting and challenging program for us. Uh, wind, uh, 1,000 megawatt. But also, uh, we work with potential investors in intergovernmental agreement way. Uh, for example, we agreed uh, with uh, Mazda to develop a 500 megawatt wind farm in northern Uzbekistan. And uh, during uh, Tashkent Investment Forum, uh, the 5th of 6th of March, uh, we are expecting that uh, PPA will be signed. Also, we are working with other potential investors. Now, uh, I can say we have proposals around uh, 3 cents per kilowatt hour for wind farms. And uh, from the beginning, uh, government decided no feed-in tariffs, but how to support uh, renewables. We agreed that uh, there will be a mechanism of long-term PPAs, because now we have a single buyer model of power market, so there will be long-term PPAs. Uh, government will sign uh, also government support agreement because we provide some tax exemptions for renewables. Mm -hmm. And uh, our target is by 2025 to reach at least uh, half of those figures I mentioned. Uh, I mean, uh, it's about 3,000 megawatt for solar and uh, 1,500 for wind. Thank you. This is impressive. I mean, the total overall, I counted about 8 gigawatt of renewables in Uzbekistan coming at some point. And this is what the world wants to hear, basically, gigawatts, gigawatts of clean, clean energy. Thank you very much. And um, over to Ms. Saspanova, I know uh, right across the border from Uzbekistan, 
Over the last few years, uh, Kazakhstan uh, installed one gigawatt of renewable capacity. And in addition, the government switched from the feed-in tariff scheme to uh, competitive auctions, which also showed impressive results. So for a coal-dominated country like Kazakhstan, this is a decisive success. From the policy perspective, what do you think were the key enablers to get there, where, where, is, where Kazakhstan is now? But what also, what were the, the challenges? Спасибо, Аида, за вопрос. Конечно, имея десятилетний опыт развития возобновляемой энергетики в Казахстане, мы уже можем говорить и о каких-то достижениях, и о уроках, которые мы получили за свой опыт. Если говорить о тех достижениях, которые есть на сегодняшний день, конечно, чуть больше одного гигаватта возобновляемой энергетики в Казахстане – дают 2,3% в общей генерации электроэнергии. Для каких-то стран это очень большой показатель. Для Казахстана это хороший старт, поскольку угольная генерация 10 лет назад занимала 80%. И на момент начала развития возобновляемой энергетики стоял очень простой вопрос – развивать дальше угольную генерацию, но получать при этом огромные нагрузки на экологию, либо переходить на чистые источники. Но это связано с дорогой электроэнергией на тот момент, с непонятными технологиями и с вызовами как для системного оператора, так и для экономики в целом. Поскольку за каждый киловатт-час электроэнергии возобновляемой энергетики страна платит, потребители платят, каждый из нас. Но, тем не менее, политическая поддержка, которая была оказана сектору возобновляемой энергетики, спустя 10 лет она дает свои плоды. Последние два года Казахстан перешел на, от системы фиксированных тарифов и гарантированной покупки на 15 лет офтейкерам, мы перешли к аукционам. То есть, чтобы получить 15-летний контракт с единым закупщиком электроэнергии возобновляемой энергетики, Потенциальный инвестор должен прийти выиграть аукцион, и только после этого он будет иметь возможность 15 лет продавать электроэнергию расчетно-финансовому центру. На сегодняшний день мы уже имеем 1 гигаватт вот таких аукционных проектов, и эти 1 гигаватт уже подписали контракты, и первые проекты уже в этом году будут вводиться эти станции. Отличительной чертой также является то, что мы даем тарифы в национальной валюте на 15 лет. И, конечно, у нас еще есть большие обсуждения относительно условий ППИ контрактов. И в этом нам большую помощь оказывает как Европейский банк. Мы уже практически больше 10 лет сотрудничаем по развитию сектора рынка возобновляемой энергетики с ЕБРР. Но также и международные организации, такие как ЮСАИД, программа развития ООН, другие банки. И это позволяет нам учитывать и те условия, на которые придут инвесторы, международный опыт развития технологий возобновляемой энергетики. И поэтому я думаю, что успех развития возобновляемой энергетики в Казахстане, он связан с, со всеми этими факторами. Но мы надеемся, что и мы верим в то, что в последующие годы мы будем более активно вводить мощности возобновляемой энергетики. Если говорить о крупных проектах, то солнечные станции в прошлом году мы ввели несколько 100-мегаваттных станций, и это уже такой достаточно серьезные проекты, которые влияют на энергосистему. В этом году будут вводиться крупные проекты по ветру, также по 100 мегаватт парки будут вводиться в разных регионах Казахстана. У нас значительный потенциал по ветроэнергетике и очень хороший потенциал на юге Казахстана по солнцу. И грех не пользоваться этими богатствами. Поэтому я надеюсь, что Казахстанская энергосистема в будущем она за счет возобновляемой энергетики она будет оздоравливаться и не только потому, что это снижение влияния на экологию. В этом году мы получили достаточно конкурентные тарифы на аукционах и если говорить о бенчмарке, то 3,2 цента в пересчете в 
условно, на доллары. Это сегодняшняя стоимость солнечной энергетики в Казахстане. 4,5 цента, цента – это ветер, и у нас также гидроэнергетика, малая гидроэнергетика, она также вносит свою, свою лепту в развитие возобновляемой энергетики. Понятно, что традиционно крупная гидроэнергетика, она также развивается, и она дает 10% долю, мы ее считаем отдельно, но тем не менее оздоровление энергосистемы Казахстана, генерации, она позволит, наверное, сделать, трансформировать рынок Казахстана. И это очень важно, и это то, что предстоит в последующие десятилетия Казахстану сделать. Thank you very much, Айнур. Indeed, Kazakhstan has its own unique renewable story, uh, maybe different to others, but what matters is that Kazakhstan reaches certain milestones and you are, where you, you are seeing it in the, in the auction prices. So probably, probably something's been done, been done correctly. Um, moving, on, moving on to the Caucasus region and to uh, Mr. Zaur Mamadov, we've seen another big player, a newcomer, Azerbaijan, coming in, onto the renewable area. Azerbaijan recently announced uh, two successful tenders, uh, 200 megawatt solar, 240 megawatt wind, uh, with two experienced international developers. From your, just this recent experience, what were the key factors uh, and key lessons and key takeaways from this tender process? So, please. Thank you, Ainur. Uh, Azerbaijan, as you know, always open for innovation and global trends, and we recently joined the Paris Agreement and uh, we're planning to reduce green gases emissions uh, up to 35 percent until 2030 and increase the share of renewables in the general uh, world generation up to 30 percent till 2030 and one of the first steps toward these goals uh, was the signing these two implementation agreements it was actually three stage selection among the seven companies who submitted their bids and uh, Saudi Arabian Aquapower and uh, United Arab Emirates Mazdar propose more competitive uh, bids and was uh, elected like uh, developers for the two projects. As you mentioned, this is 240 megawatts of wind and uh, 200 megawatts of solar. Regarding the approach, so we uh, decide to go through to the um, uh, competitive tariffs without any subsidies from the government side. Um, today this is 3.2 for the wind and 3.3 for the solar, which is the very competitive, including the VAT. And we expect to production of 1.4 billion uh, kilowatt hours from that source, which will bring 350,000 cubic meter of the, uh, sorry, million cubic meter of the gas. And that safe gas is the potential for the export. As you know, Azerbaijan is the most important uh, gas exporter in the, in the region. So uh, totally the 400 million USD investment expected and uh, this is the first and most significant step in development of renewables. Um, you know, Azerbaijan, the abundant by the oil and gas, but also abundant by the renewable sources of the energy. So about uh, 3,000 mega megawatt is estimated wind potential and about 20,000 megawatt is the uh, estimated solar potential as well as uh, 300 megawatt bio and 700 megawatt geothermal and we're planning to develop all these segments. So I would like to emphasize here the role of European Bank Reconstruction and Development because uh, it's uh, our partner for the first auction which we're planning in the second half of the 2020. We already identified eight most promising areas uh, both for the wind and for the solar and planning to develop these sites both from the uh, energy resources point of view and from the grid point of view. The connection to the grid, this is another challenging story mm -hmm. and here we uh, develop the governmental program uh, for the grid development 
and uh, for the, uh, those areas which includes to the, uh, our auction uh, plan, auction schedule, will be fully, uh, will be fully um, supported by the infrastructure, by the grid, and those costs will be fully covered by the government of Azerbaijan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daur. Um, with, well, moving on, um, uh, Mr. Georgi Cikovani, with my EBRD hat on, uh, Georgian, I can say Georgia Hydropower was the cradle of project finance, at least in our institution, probably in the region. Um, the country is now looking to diversify into non-hydro renewables, and we've seen the record low prices for solar in the Caucasus and Central Asia. So the competition, we see the competition delivers magic, basically, even in the countries where, uh, which used to have vertically integrated state monoliths. Very quickly, competition catches up. So what's uh, Georgia's take? Uh, what's the current state of affairs, and what are the plans for the deployment of non-hydro renewables? Um, yes, you are correctly mentioned. Uh, hydropower was dominated, was dominating uh, source of energy in Georgian energy mix. But uh, changes uh, to the technology and recent developments uh, in the world renewable sector, we also try to catch up with this uh, trend. And uh, it's very encouraging that uh, we see uh, wind energy is getting uh, the very popular uh, investment sector in Georgia. Uh, just uh, to give you numbers, uh, we currently, our maximum um, uh, peak demand is 2,000 megawatts, and uh, for the next 10 years, Georgia uh, plans to invest and develop 1,200 megawatt of wind power alone until 2030. We also plan to invest and develop around 500, 600 megawatt of solar plant until uh, 2030 for the next uh, 10 years. So this is uh, uh, huge numbers for Georgia, but since we are small uh, sector, small uh, energy system. So as you see, uh, uh, renewable alternative sources are competing, competing without any additional support, any additional help uh, from government with the hydro. First, it's uh, easier to build, it's faster to build, it has less uh, uh, construction risks, it has less seasonality, especially wind compared to hydro, so it has many, many advantages. Our, uh, for the, uh, this year plan, uh, uh, there is, uh, we don't have so first solar yet, so we try to develop first utility-sized solar power plant. It's around 25 megawatt sized, and in um, a few months we will announce uh, auction. And that will be the first election. We expect, of course, the competitive crisis, and with the help of EBRD, we also plan to announce uh, uh, second and third um, uh, auctions for solar as well as for the wind. So we are very uh, positive, and we are sure that uh, the uh, prices, what we've seen in the region, gives us hope that uh, with uh, hydro we will also develop very strongly the wind and solar. Thank you. Excellent. Um, well, we have another country which is undergoing major energy transition. So, Ms. Mirjana Filipovic, Serbia, in 2016, the government filled the 500 megawatt quota for wind, which was commissioned last September and October, coming online. So, we see currently strong interest in, from local and international sponsors. What are the further plans to build up on the, on the 500 megawatt, which is, which is very impressive for Serbia? Uh, First of all, thank you for this question and this opportunity to say something about our government and ministry see like a very big successful. Uh, why is successful? Because uh, Serbian is a state which produce is based on the lignite, 70% of this. And uh, Serbia and our ministry is responsibility and we see the necessary of energy transition. Uh, as you say, last uh, five years ago, we start negotiation with all participants to make a good uh, PPA. What does it mean for us? It doesn't mean that we can uh, have these 500 megawatts on the grid. It was a, a big step for us, and it was necessary uh, to have all uh, parties around the table because uh, you have a successful project when the project is on the grid. Uh, our next steps is very, uh, very conclusive to, to that we uh, start to finish something in according with uh, green energy. 
Also, we are in negotiation with our transmission system, how the grid is, uh, can take the energy from the, the green energy. And also, we have a big discussion with EBRD to help us to, to, other, to, to do another step to going on the auction systems. This is something uh, on which we done all last year, and now we are uh, continue to last on mm. this because uh, it is necessary to have uh, all uh, figures uh, in good way that we can put another 500 megawatts on the grid. Also, it's necessary calculations, and uh, you know it is necessary to uh, have all participants satisfied. Thank you, Thank you Viriana. And the follow-up question to that, what is the ultimate energy mix um, that Serbia is targeting? Because uh, it's very similar, for example, to Kazakhstan in different countries, but also 70-80% of coal dominance, so what is your, what is your goal? Oh, you must know 70% from the coal is for one country in this period is very difficult to mix everything. You must know you, you have a very strong uh, unity. It is uh, necessary to everybody will be satisfied. And you know mm. we have a uh, hydro potential uh, produced from the hydro potential is 30%. Also, the government and ministry development project for the biomass biogas, uh, and this is something w what also done in previous period uh, through the PPA. Uh, now, when we look at uh, the future steps, uh, it is necessary to develop an auctions model. Auctions model, we must look how to develop an auctions model. Are we developing auctions model for the some new solar plants or for the some? Uh, wind park, uh, we will see. It is something what is uh, necessary to calculate and to make a good actions plan. Because you know, we as, as a part energy community, we have uh, some goals. And these goals is uh, to the end of this year is 27% from the renewable energy. Now I cannot tell you is we are close to 27 or not. We will see by the end of the year. But as a state, as a ministry, we developed uh, the project about national uh, national targets and uh, for us is also important uh, because uh, uh, the last year uh, we uh, finished regulatory for the biofuels what is also the part for the calculation for the national targets uh, as we talk about our uh, energy mix uh, we will uh, stay in continue to develop the green energy and uh, for us as a ministry is very important and for all of you to know that our public company is uh, owner of the state and when you in the public company introduce uh, the project from the e green energy it is big impact uh, for the whole the, the, the future and the whole the people in Serbia. Thank you, thank you Mirjana and um, it's, it's indeed we haven't talked about biomass that much but it is, it's an ingredient, the biofuels are coming online as well. So alongside hydrogen and other things that will also be part of the, of hopefully, of energy mix of future. Um, Your Excellency, um, w the government of North Macedonia have recently concluded, as you mentioned, successful auctions um, for, the, for the premium, at the, which came out at 1.65 for the premium itself. How, what were, key ingredients of success, basically, in North Macedonia for that. Can you, can you share with us? Uh, I think the key successes were probably the fact that the state would offer the land to the companies and they would also support connecting it to the grid. That would be one of the key successes. And at the same time, I think the prices are coming down drastically when it comes to the uh, solar panels. However, I, if I may just actually just switch around and uh, just comment further on uh, the State Secretary's uh, statements. We regionally all have, and I mean the Boston welcomes, we have similar issues. We have legacy energy production of, from coal. And one of the key things we probably all need to look at, try and work together and find the synergies and see how we can move forward. Uh, we're not the only ones, and I think, uh, unfortunately, I can say the same thing for Serbia as North Macedonia and other countries around us. We all face the issue of air pollution. And one of the main reasons is also actually the way we generate energy. We haven't actually worked in the past as much towards renewable energy. The potential is there. For example, for us in North Macedonia, let me put it this way, we're very blessed to have sun. And we, can, we have a huge potential when it comes to uh, solar. We haven't actually done it yet, but we are. The government currently is working really hard on promoting that. We are trying to, well, together with the IFIs, 
starting some uh, projects and further will be offering further potential uh, investments in the renewable sector. Thank you. No, indeed, West Balkans is a really is a really interesting region of of interest by many IFI, specifically along the lines of the just transition we discussed earlier, but also just helping the, the countries shift away from the coal dependency, from this legacy lignite that is polluting and uh, creating issues, not just in the CO2 globally, but locally, uh, local air pollutants and the health of people in the... In the just add to that, because it's not just us. I mean, we're all small countries in the West Balkans, by size as well. So if we're polluting in North Macedonia and everyone else, let's say, is using clean energy, it doesn't mean that our issues are not their issues and their issues are not ours. So it's very important that we actually all work together because the air will not stop at the border. No. The air will come towards us from Serbia and our will flow towards Greece, for example, etc. Hence the importance, in my opinion, of working together. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bayraktar, you kept us in suspense on the um, post-2020 post. <laughs> uh, setup. Post-2020, everybody is expecting uh, from me to say this is a new uh, fit into our figures after 2020. Uh, and yesterday, by the way, EBRD delegation was in Ankara. They, they were visiting me and I couldn't disclose the information to them. <laughs> So, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to say anything here as well. But I'm going to tell you the, the main principles or fundamentals of this uh, new scheme. Uh, <clears throat> but before moving to that, <clears throat> in general, uh, we would like to integrate more renewables uh, into our energy system. That's, that's for sure. Because the transition that I mentioned uh, in, the, in the first part of the, uh, this, this conversation, uh, Turkey uh, has done many market reforms uh, to move away from, uh, again, like a vertically integrated model into a market model in the, in the first phase of transition. And in 2017, we announced our new national energy and mining policy, which is describing the transition 2.0. And uh, in this policy document, it was a very comprehensive uh, policy document. Uh, and it, it wasn't only focusing on energy prices or electricity prices, uh, but it was more like a, a industry focused uh, to uh, considering the job creation, uh, localization, uh, business opportunities for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. So it was a very comprehensive program. And three main pillars of this uh, policy was security of supply. Uh, Turkey heavily relies on imported resources, so we have to be careful on that. Uh, localization and also predictability in the market for investors. So investment on energy infrastructure, because it is very essential to integrate more renewables. So investment on infrastructure uh, is essential part of security of supply. That's why we are investing a lot on our gas and uh, electricity grid. 2016-2020 uh, period, uh, our distribution companies uh, were investing uh, almost $3.5 billion uh, to infrastructure. In this period of time, Teyash is investing almost $2.5 billion to be able to uh, integrate more coal or renewables into our energy systems. That's, that's a very essential part of the, uh, the system. Uh, and also we would like to increase the in, uh, interconnection capacities. We have an, uh, excellent examples with our Georgian uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, now Turkey uh, is importing uh, renewable resources uh, generated electricity from Georgia and we would like to increase this capacity. Uh, in this new era, uh, what I can say is uh, we need more flexibility. We are moving towards more flexible energy systems. That's why natural gas is still quite important, although uh, at the beginning I said it was a game changer for uh, gas, especially uh, in Turkey. We need uh, natural gas in our energy mix. Uh, in a more flexible way, and that's why I think we need to create a level playing field for, for all investors. 
CCGTs were suffering last couple of years in Turkey because of high uh, gas prices. But uh, LNG uh, is now uh, changing this, uh, this new uh, set of rules and we are, uh, we are approaching an important milestone in Turkey because in 2021 Turkey's uh, long-term gas contracts is going to expire very significant amount 30% of existing supplies supply contract uh, is uh, is going to expire so in that sense what we are seeing last couple of years 2018 2019 and 2020 it's going to even uh, bigger numbers that the LNG role LNG share in gas side will increase very significantly very cheap, very competitive prices, and more flexible terms and conditions. So existing pipeline suppliers need to understand this, this changing uh, paradigm. So hope, and we, we, we would like to keep uh, CCGTs alive and on board because we need them as an intermittent resources. We need flexible backup systems. Uh, so we need more comprehensive and integrated uh, resource planning in this new world uh, to create uh, right market conditions and market mechanisms which incentivize again again more flexibility uh, we should integrate demand side management into our new market model uh, again less distortive uh, less costly and to include also battery system into our energy systems post 2020 uh, I can again give you some, some of the fundamentals and principles. Uh, what I can say, there will be, uh, again, fit in tariff scheme, uh, although you will see uh, different figures, especially for solar and wind. Uh, new legislation will continue to support local content I cannot give you any specifics on that, but you need to understand our journey uh, about the local content. Again, Turkey, over the last decade, uh, annually paid 40, 44 billion dollars of energy import in terms of fuel. And when we started to introduce renewables, it was, a, it was an excellent achievement to replace or reduce this import dependency in terms of fuel. But when we look at the numbers, almost 7,000 megawatt of wind and 6,000 megawatt of solar, as of today, means at least seven to eight billion dollars or euros of uh, equipment import. So that's why with this new model of YECA, a new uh, renewable integration model, that we try to address also this problem, that to reduce our import dependency in terms of content or equipment. So that's why uh, this is our ongoing discussion between our uh, uh, financial partners, EBRD. Uh, they have some constraints about this local content premium, but eventually, uh, again, this is also important for people, for the citizens of uh, Turkey to absorb and accept the, the integration of renewables. They, they are paying already some premium for that. So that's why uh, the integration of renewables with local content will be in this new, uh, new scheme. Uh, but also in this new scheme, look, last couple of years, everybody is in this room know well that the Turkish energy investors suffered a lot and the market uh, uh, has gone through a major challenge uh, with, with two things. Uh, the first one, we started to see some uh, uh, low pace of uh, demand increase. We were expecting, everybody was expecting and made all their calculations and uh, assessment for those projects when they make investment that the demand was inc is going to increase like 5%, 6%, 7%. It wasn't happening, last, especially the last couple of years. Uh, so this is the first thing and, and, and obviously it followed by the low uh, market prices. Uh, so and the second thing, in 2018 and 2019, the, the, the currency volatility and increase on the, uh, the currency and the exposure that the, the investors uh, faced uh, was also huge. So these two things get together, it created kind of perfect storm uh, for the investors. So in this new scheme, we are 
although this is not for valid for renewables, but for coal power generator invest, investors or CCGTs, it, it was the valid uh, arg argument. So that's why in this new set of scheme, in this new uh, set of rules, we would like to address also the currency exposure problem. So that's uh, another fundamentals uh, in the new scheme. Uh, also, I would like to say a few words on upcoming developments uh, in, in, in, in the new technologies, in newcomers. Smart grid roadmap or the implementation and action plans will be introduced soon by the ministry and also the regulatory agency. Uh, demand side management draft legislation presented uh, to EMRA, EMRA board and the commission hopefully uh, will, will announce it soon. Uh, battery storage uh, roadmap uh, prepared and will be introduced this year. But uh, the next big thing in Turkey hopefully will be energy efficiency. Energy efficiency, we have a, a very nice, very comprehensive plan, energy efficiency action plan. We work with EBRD uh, very hard on that. Uh, we announced it in 2018 uh, and hopefully, hopefully uh, in this uh, upcoming years, we are going to be able to successfully implement all these uh, action plans that uh, we identify there. And Turkey uh, has, a, has a great potential on energy efficiency. The, the target is to reduce our primary energy consumption by 14 percent, a significant number. Uh, 66 million tons of CO2 emission will be uh, reduced. So uh, this uh, will help us to also reduce our import dependency, uh, also uh, more clean, uh, clean uh, way, of, uh, way of development. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And um, I think you touched, on, especially on the first part of your speech, you, you, you touched on a, very, on a raw nerve of renewables today. It's not an issue to produce renewables cheaply anymore. The issue is to incorporate them into the grid yes. successfully and without disruption. And you mentioned the key ingredients of success. You mentioned the update, upgrade of transmission lines, storage, demand side management, smart metering. You, in the opening speech, you mentioned consumers are becoming producers, producers are becoming. This is all a great package. So we really, this is what we at the BRD would like to see and hear more. So next question to Mr. Hajayev. From a regional perspective, we see neighboring countries are there in your region focused on the hydro development. We, we're talking, I'm talking Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, for example. While Uzbekistan has a large share of gas fire generation. So following from um, Mr. Bayraktar's speech, how does the ministry see this regional cooperation playing into better integration of renewables? within Uzbekistan and outside of it. So we have the ingredients of hydro, we have solar, we have intermittent solar and wind, we have gas it's probably as a base load. So what is, what is your thinking on, on this potentially cross-border power trade being a help, helping factor for uh, even in out the renewables? Yes, you are right. Uh, our neighbor countries, uh, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, uh, they uh, were rich to hydro resources. And uh, currently, uh, they have announced uh, big programs to develop hydro energy sector. And uh, what is very important, we understand that the regional uh, collaboration will be win-win uh, for all countries. Uh, even uh, just as an example, uh, with Tajikistan, uh, leaders of two countries agreed that uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan together will develop uh, two hydropower plants in the territory of Tajikistan and Uzbekistan will be the off-taker of this energy. Of course we understand that uh, hydro generation is very important uh, during uh, solar and wind uh, implementation. Uh, to cover the fluctuations, to cover the evening peaks. And also, we understand that we cannot um, give up from uh, gas-fired power plants. So we have uh, a program to retire old, all, all of our old gas-fired power plants by 2025. Uh, it's about, it's uh, close to 9,000 megawatt. And uh, instead of them, uh, there will be uh, 
many power plants with the new CCGT technologies. We are going to use uh, H and J class turbines. And uh, we agreed that uh, till the end of this year, uh, Tajikistan uh, will become the member of the single system of Central Asia mm -hmm. again because as you may know till uh, 20, 2009 they used to be in this circle so uh, now we are working on reconnection and uh, we expect from uh, 2021 uh, Tajikistan's hydro uh, sources will help us uh, and uh, of course, their expectation also the same. Mm -hmm. Gas fire power plants, especially in uh, winter time, should support their energy uh, sector, and it will be. Uh, with uh, Kyrgyzstan, who also has uh, big uh, hydro sources, we always work in parallel regime. So. Uh, There is also more ways for collaboration because we understand, uh, we all understand that the renewables, implementing of uh, solar, especially and wind, will be a big challenge for all the countries. And uh, now we started to uh, negotiate how to create a regional uh, energy market can be the head market, can be long-term uh, negotiations, but of course it's a very uh, beginning, mm -hmm. first steps, but we understand that till end of uh, next year, we hope that uh, such a market will be established. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. This, is, this is indeed very ambitious, but given the speed and progress so far in Uzbekistan, nothing would surprise me. Moving on to Ainur, Ainur, uh, we know that um, in Kazakhstan the approach has been sort of a very managed increase in renewables. And when I say managed, there are targets, 3% by 20, end of 2020, 10% uh, by 2030. So it's, is there any plan to actually go beyond the targets that Kazakhstan declared? Because it seems like 3%, not a kilowatt hour more. So it's a very, is there, is there more aspiration coming in Kazakhstan? Конечно, обеспечение трехпроцентной доли в конце 2020 года, мы уже сегодня с уверенностью можем сказать, что эта доля будет обеспечена. И у нас есть уже и контракты, которые, по которым электростанции строятся, инвестиции в страну заходят, и 3% по итогам 2020 года Казахстан возобновляемую энергетику будет иметь. Для обеспечения 10% доли в 2030 году Казахстану необходимо еще провести огромную работу, поскольку первый такой существенный вызов от 10% – это, конечно же, интеграция возобновляемой энергетики в существующую энергосистему, и энергосистема должна готовиться к этому. В этой связи мы сейчас обсуждаем в парламенте закон, в рамках которого Будем стимулировать реализацию проектов маневренных мощностей, то есть это гидроэлектростанции, газовые станции, которые позволят сделать нашу энергосистему более гибкой. Дальше, конечно же, и на региональном, и на центральном, национальном уровне сетевая инфраструктура должна подготовиться. И в южной зоне региональные сети сейчас просчитывают, каким образом усилить эти сети, чтобы... Там, где действительно хороший потенциал по ветру, по солнцу, чтобы там можно было реализовать более эффективные проекты, вот эти сети мы будем развивать. Интеллектуальная часть, которая должна обеспечивать гибкость энергосистемы, так называемые смарт-гриды, эти решения также должны быть интегрированы в нашу систему. Ну, а что касается развития самих возобновляемых источников энергии, мы понимаем, что наиболее разумный подход в этой части – это правильное размещение объектов возобновляемой энергетики. И преимущество возобновляемой энергетики в том, что они позволяют генерировать там, где есть место потребления. И в этой связи 
разумное размещение возобновляемой энергетики и проведение так называемых проектных аукционов – это то будущее, которое мы себе представляем. И в этой связи тот проект, который мы делаем совместно с Европейским банком реконструкции и развития, когда в 2021 году будет подготовлено несколько проектов по ветру с измеренным ветровым потенциалом, с подготовленной точкой подключения, с выделенным земельным участком, с оценкой всего экологического, экологической оценкой по проектам. И именно вот, вот эти вот проекты, которые мы планируем в конце 2021 года выставить на аукционы по ветру, пожалуй, позволят снизить все риски неопределенности инвесторов, которые который существует, когда инвестор принимает решение, инвестировать в страну или нет. Когда у нас уже есть и понимание, каков потенциал по конкретной площадке, когда уже выделен земельный участок и определена точка подключения, инвестору нет необходимости делать там, 10 кругов, 100 кругов для того, чтобы согласовать этот весь проект. Это на себя берет Министерство энергетики. И это позволит наверняка сделать очень эффективные проекты. В прошлом году подобный проект мы сделали по Солнцу в Туркестанской области, и нефтяная компания «Эни» выиграла этот аукцион и дала тариф 3,2 цента. Мы надеемся, что это позволит не только сделать эффективный проект, но и сделать его недорогим, то есть снизить тариф. То есть вот эти вот аспекты, они позволят нам дальше развивать и внедрять 10% в 2030 году. Будет больше, это зависит от стоимости технологий, от, на, и в том числе от ценового паритета между угольной генерацией, газовой генерацией и возобновляемой энергетикой. Сегодня мы уже понимаем, что с новой угольной генерацией солнечная энергетика уже сопоставима. Газовая генерация также. И с учетом того, что стоимость угольной генерации даже в Казахстане, стоимость добычи угля растет, транспортировка растет, то мы думаем, что 10% в 2030 году – это, наверное, тот низший уровень, который мы будем достигать. Спасибо. Спасибо. Um, next question to Zaur. Um, you've, heard, you've heard the lessons learned. You had your own experience successful um, in Azerbaijan. But what do you think will be the key challenges in your country to deploy more, to go beyond the 440 that you have now currently with Mazdar and Akva? What will it take? Actually, this year is very crucial for Azerbaijan because we're planning to uh, start transformation to the liberal market. We start new policy in energy efficiency with support of uh, EU. We start uh, new policy in renewable energy development. And we uh, expect a serious change in, within this year. Uh, regarding how we plan to develop and what kind of challenges in front of us, actually the challenges is the almost similar in uh, Azerbaijan like in other neighboring uh, for us countries. We have to recognize that still the main source of energy will be gas because this is the local and this is still cheap source of energy and our system today about the 80% based on the gas firing. Yes, this is the very modern plan. This is based on combined cycle technologies and average efficiency in our grid about 45-50 um, uh, persons with the, about 300 uh, grams uh, per kilowatt hours is the efficiency. But, uh, of course, um, the implementation of renewables, this is the main goal, as I mentioned. Today we are 70% in the whole uh, generation, but we're planning to increase it up to 30% till the 2030. And we know how to do that. So we have a very clear strategy, and we uh, know which, uh, which challenges in front of us, and we uh, do really extremely important and uh, we're a big amount of work in order to reduce all these barriers. 
we uh, know that the main direction is auctions, auctions with the um, attracting of the FDIs. Um, uh, today, uh, the, for the first auctions, we're developing a number of the doc documents, including the RFQ, RFPs, and other things. And uh, thanks to BRD for supporting us. This is another piece of guarantee that the first auction will be um, the successful. And we already achieved the target 3.2 cents, which is the comply with the existing today tariffs in Azerbaijan. But we expect even the more uh, some more reduction and the renewable energy tariffs and uh, this is looks very achievable from now um, from of course the main aspects this is the legislative and contractual base from the legislative point of view we develop uh, the new renewable energy law which is the comply with european union energy package 3 Mm -hmm. This is quite a revolutionary document uh, which will bring the very significant things uh, first time in the history of the energy development of Azerbaijan. We develop new energy efficiency law, regulatory law, again the energy uh, electricity market law and it will be create well, a solid background for the uh, upcoming projects. From the contractual point of view, among with the PPA, which is the very common with developing also the off-take agreement, connection agreement, and also concession agreement, which will bring additional guarantees for the potential investors, uh, which is um, uh, not reflected in the current legislation. So this is quite um, very soft environment for the FDI attractions and those uh, two uh, pilot, how we call it, pilot projects, which uh, recently signed with the Aqua and with Mazda, shows again, despite of the uh, current uh, legislation is not flexible enough, so it is possible to have such a contracts and it is possible to achieve s uh, the, ex the low targeted low uh, tariffs. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the solar and wind, this is the main direction today, uh, and we know uh, already uh, uh, the assessed uh, potential, which is the very impressive. Uh, this is the about 3,000 uh, megawatt and 20,000 megawatt of solar, mm -hmm. and we respectively, if we take into consideration that general uh, grid capacity is about 800, so this is really very good chance to uh, for the transformation from the uh, fossil uh, soil of uh, sources of energy to the renewable one. Of course, the grid. This is another challenge I mentioned in my the previous the, the, the notes that grid. This is another uh, important issue. The, our colleagues from the Georgia, which is the also post-Soviet countries, know that system wasn't. Uh, at that time developed enough, uh, but we spent enormous amount of the money and energy with the directly from the government of Azerbaijan and with the assistance of IFIs to improve that grid and its process still continues. We have the grid strengthness plan until the 2025, which will be developing the parallel with another strategy of renewable renewables development. So the, all the components, which is the plot of the land with the assessed potential of the wind or solar. So grid development uh, program and uh, transition to the liberal market, new legislation, new contractual base. So all these ingredients, I think, uh, will uh, bring them uh, successful results in the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Zawur. It's, um, it's really interesting to see how, we're, well, the, what the conclusions are coming out. I mean, the renewables are cheap. The grid constraints have to be watched very carefully across the region. Um, but also there's another factor of different market setups in our, in, in our countries. And uh, Grigori, we know, um, Georgi, sorry, um, we, we know that uh, Georgia is moving towards market liberalization um, with 50% starting from May 19, 2019 uh, and uh, just moving full speed ahead. How would renewables be integrated into this market liberalized model? Because this is something for other countries that might be interesting as well. Thank you. Um, yes, after uh, joining energy community, Georgia aggressively started uh, developing competitive markets 
we follow very closely our uh, colleagues from Turkish experience. Uh, we've seen what results and what benefits brought the market liberalization and competitive market. So uh, two things I would like to mention is that uh, when we announced our plans for market liberalization, uh, we already have some achievements. Uh, we have uh, around 17 concession agreements. It's around 105 uh, megawatts uh, of uh, renewable energy projects which uh, refuse to have any government guarantees, any PPAs. And those uh, investors, of course, uh, those are small and medium-sized projects, but those investors are willing to take market risks and they believe in the future that the market will be developed, market will be uh, uh, fair, uh, fair price, and uh, they will be treated uh, with a playing level field. Uh, we also think that uh, by location uh, where Georgia enjoys the uh, benefits of uh, uh, transit routes. Uh, we have access to Turkish market, which already itself is a, a big liquid market. We give uh, additional benefits to investors, and uh, we hope that the market integration with Turkey, with Azerbaijan, will even uh, create more um, benefits and opportunities for renewable energy investments. Another uh, also important subject is uh, backup and the reserve capacities which uh, regional integration can offer. So two things, it's uh, market liberalization, competitive market and regional integration are also two major issues which can uh, support and promote investment in renewable energy. Thank you, Georgi. You actually extended the line of conclusions for today uh, to include the cross-border cross train, how it could be an answer to the intermittency of renewables. Absolutely. Well, fascinating discussion and a great journey across our region. I would like to open the floor uh, for questions from the audience. Um, so if, um, if we have the Roman microphone going down, any questions? This is, um, yes, please. Do we, we do, um. I'll, I'll speak loudly, that's okay. Excellent. Uh, Thanks for the question. Uh, as I uh, said during my uh, second part of the uh, comments, yes, uh, we, we, we prepare a, a storage uh, roadmap uh, together with the regulatory commission and soon we are going to introduce this because we believe the biggest challenge and the, the lesson learned from today's uh, conversation is in the future for Turkey, the integration of more renewables and that's why the storage is providing a great, great opportunity. So, uh, yes, we do have a plans and we will announce it soon. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Questions, please? It was such an informative panel, basically. We covered a lot of ground in all senses. So if there are no more questions from the audience, um, I, I must to, uh, inform you that uh, the lunch is served outside of the ballroom at 12.15. It will last for one hour. And after the lunch, there will be next panel session, uh, which will be titled The Transition Towards a Subsidy-Free World. Uh, very intriguing and very interesting discussion. So thank you very much, and thank you to our great panel. Thank you.